The thing is, with both Web3 and VR, if you thought that was interesting a year ago, it's still interesting. Nothing's really changed. Like 98% of all the nonsense has kind of gone away. But if it was early 2022 and you thought VR headsets are going to be a device that two or three billion people own, like nothing's changed in the last year to change that. If you think that we might build a billion scale consumer software, consumer internet service on a blockchain, which is really what Web3 means. Yeah, if you thought that a year ago, you should probably still think that. Still five years away, but it's just as interesting now as it was then. But it's five years away. Whereas as this sort of second wave of AI, I mean, it had been kind of bubbling away very quietly for sort of five years. I mean, the first demos of using generative networks to make faces and things are 2014. And they look terrible. They look very interesting. And then sort of suddenly in the last six months, as I said, suddenly this has worked. Or something's working. And then the question is, well, what is it that's working and what will it become? Welcome to Analyze Asia, the premier podcast dedicated to dissecting the pulse of business technology and media in Asia. I'm Bernard Leung, and over the past two years, we've shifted from the metaverse to AI. Is ChatGPT an electricity moment, an iPhone moment, or something different to jumpstart another paradigm shift? Today, my guest needs no introduction, Benedict Evans, an independent analyst who I read and listen frequently to, and venture partner to Mosaic Ventures and Entrepreneur First to frame the right questions to think about the future of generative AI. Benedict, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Hey, since our last conversation, what have you been up to? Actually, when, when's the last time we spoke? <laughs> oh, that was, about, that was about one and a half years ago. We were, we were talking yeah, yeah. about AI right. at that point in time, and that was just yeah. before the crypto boom started and then crash, of course. Well, which crypto boom? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's a very high level point here that the sort of tech industry kind of goes in waves and we'd had the mobile wave and there were sort of five years of people saying, well, OK, mobile's kind of happened now. And now what? And of course, on one level, it's kind of a meaning that for a lot of companies, it's kind of a meaningless question, because if you're building enterprise SaaS or you're building kind of e-commerce enablement, enablement tools or something, what you're doing is building on the fact that everybody on earth has a smartphone, like 5 billion people have a smartphone, like what next is, that's not your problem. But meanwhile, we have this kind of these, all these sort of different candidates that kind of people pick up and put down. So is it voice, maybe voice is like the next platform, the messaging is the new platform. And then it's Bitcoin. No, it's Ethereum. No, it's Web3. It's VR. No, it's Metaverse. It's AR. It's, it's wearables. It's smart home. And so you've got all these kind of different things floating around. And certainly kind of this time last year, the way I would have framed it was that you have these two things that are sort of an explosion of buzzwords around Metaverse and Web3 that have something interesting kind of at the core. But it's going to kind of take quite a long time before those things would happen. And it's very unclear what they would be. And meanwhile, AI, which had been a completely different timeline, AI sort of starts working in 2013, 2014. And 2021, 22, all of that, had, we kind of understood it and it was it all worked and it was all in wide deployment. And every company, every like big industrial company is using 20 different machine learning things and they don't call it AI anymore. It's just, it's become part of software. And meanwhile, there was this kind of weird like generative network stuff and these weird GAN things and these chatbots, which are just kind of, Interesting, like for the front, the phrase we used was frontier AI, which is, well, AI isn't finished yet. So what's the next sort of AI stuff that's going to happen? And then as we all kind of know, in the last six months, this stuff went from sort of interesting demo to, oh my God, this is the next thing demo. Uh, it's funny, just talking about this, I'm reminded there was a TED talk, I think in early 2000, let me think when it would have been. So it was maybe six months before the iPhone was announced, which I think that was at the beginning of 2007. So it must have been a TED Talk in 2006. A guy called Jeff Hound gave a demo of a multi-touch display. And it's it's like a TV size thing. And right. he's mocked up some simple demos and like you could resize a picture. And so he does, mm -hmm. it's like you can resize a picture. Everyone in the audience starts screaming and cheering. And you can rotate it. And everyone starts screaming and jumping up and down and cheering. And you mm. watch the video now and think, yeah, <laughs> we kind of forget what it was like to see that for the first time. But that wasn't the iPhone. Then the iPhone happens. And that's sort of where we are now with, with machine learning, the sort of second wave of machine learning. And suddenly, okay, no, this is the thing. This is everything. And that then just gets a whole bunch more questions, but all the questions now are about machine learning. Do you find that at least in the mobile moment, you can see that five years and then the next decade to every person on earth will have a 
smartphone today. But ever since after that, you see that every different wave, it just comes in like flashes and bits of one, two years. Like, for example, there is like Bitcoin, Ethereum 2014. And then there is this whole wave of the shared economies another two, three years. And then there hasn't been something like that you can see that it's going to go a very long wave. Of- yeah, I mean, you could say the sort of short cycle innovation, long cycle innovation. So the long cycle innovation is like mainframes, PCs, the web, smartphones. That takes you back. That starts in 1965, 15 years or so. You get this fundamental shift in the center of the tech industry. There's a sort of a parallel track, which might be sort of databases, SQL, open source, something, something, what's been shaping the way software got constructed in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. Maybe those aren't the right term. And then within that, you've got, you know, data, but I don't know, like personal information managers or PDAs, restaurant listings or taxonomies or tag clouds or photo sharing. And you get these kind of shortwave things happen every, that kind of take two or three years to, for us to understand what they are. And some of those work and some of those don't. Right? Obviously, like, like Flickr. Remember Yahoo mm. bought Flickr? For like That's right. twenty million dollars or something, it was insane. And how could it be worth that much? And then when people bought Instagram for a billion dollars, people thought that was really insane. And like this is like people have lost their fucking minds. And I guess what it's probably worth a hundred billion dollars now. You get these kind of shorter ways along the kind of the, the big curve. So all like Uber and Airbnb and Instagram, along with all sorts of stuff that didn't work. And IoT. I mean, IoT is basically a collection of, of smartphones. You know, mm. in smartphone supply chains all chips all the smart homes basically because you've got these smartphone chips so you can make a camera and a doorbell and all this stuff and so you've had all of those things every now a couple of those things people thought might this might be the next thing after smartphones this might be like the next fundamental thing and clearly that was the i mean i hesitate to say bitcoin but like blockchain but kind of that's been sort of the crypto web3 conversation particularly web3 which is web3 is like a, a one use case for blockchain and it's also what the metaverse, which is a ridiculous word, meant, which when you can you strip away all of the nonsense, really just kind of meant, well, maybe VR and AR is the next universal device of the smartphones. The thing is, with both Web3 and VR, if you thought that was interesting a year ago, it's still interesting. Nothing's really changed. Like 98% of all the nonsense has kind of gone away. But if it was early 2022 and you thought VR headsets are going to be a device that two or three billion people own, like nothing's changed in the last year to change that. If you think that we might build a billion scale consumer software, consumer internet service on a blockchain, which is really what Web3 means. Yeah, if you thought that a year ago, you should probably still think that. Still five years away, but it's still, a, it's just as interesting now as it was then. But it's five years away. Whereas as the, this sort of second wave of AI, I mean, it had been kind of bubbling away very quietly for sort of five years. I mean, the first demos of using generative networks to make faces and things are 2014. And they look terrible. They look they look very interesting. And then sort of suddenly in the last six months, as I said, suddenly this has worked or, yeah. or something's working. And then the question is, well, what is it that's working and what will it become? So I, I've been thinking about this, but before I get to the main subject of the day, I wanted to ask you, given that you have been in the business for two decades, asking important questions on key trends, technologies, whether it's from mobile to AI and also making investments in the sector. What would you share as lessons from your career journey to say with your younger audience who's listening to the show? What, what advice would you give them? Well, there's a history professor called Eve Reverapa who said history teaches us nothing except that something will happen. <laughs> and one can, you can construct any lesson from history that you like. I don't know. I mean, my career, I'm not sure I would look at my own career and, and take it as a model for anybody else. There's a little bit of brownie emotion in there. But there's a sort of three-part consultant slide, which is what are the sort of skills are you innately good at? Are you good at people? Are you good at organizing and running projects? Are you good at building meticulous pieces of thing? Like, and that might make you a lawyer or a software engineer. Like, are you meticulous and do you like carefully creating structure according to rules? That might make you a civil engineer or an aircraft engineer or a software engineer or a lawyer, depending. Do you like arguing with people? That will get you a different lawyer. And so there's that. Well, what sort of things are you good at? Do you like managing people and working with people or not? Or you do like something else? There's a second, which is like the famous line from The Graduate. I'll give you one piece of advice. Plastics. Dustin Hoffman from 1968. That's career advice. Plastics. And in 1968, that was probably really good career advice as well. Like that was a really good growth industry if you were that that person. 
So what are the industries in the, where everything is changing and there is opportunity and there is scope to build something and do something interesting? And then there's a space, there's a sort of sense of curiosity. It's sort of always a comment that VCs make is that you see a paradox of venture, which I'm not really a venture capitalist, but like the paradox of it is that you, your job is to be the most optimistic person that an entrepreneur will ever meet. Your job is to believe that these two maniacs with a PowerPoint are going to create a billion dollar company doing something that sounds stupid. That's what venture capital is. That's what startups are. And yet 99% of the things that you see, you say no to. And nine out of 10 of the deals that you do don't work. So you've got this paradox of being massively optimistic and yet spending most of your time saying no and knowing all the reasons why this isn't going to work because you've seen it fail a hundred times. And so the sort of the challenge, particularly, I think, of any for anybody getting older is to continue to look at the new thing and say, oh, wow, that's interesting, rather than looking at the new thing and saying, oh, that's bullshit, that's not going to work. Because the problem is most things are bullshit and won't work. But the things that do work look like bullshit as well. So you have to be careful with that. Yeah, but then the counterintuitive things that the VCs obey is the power law, right? <laughs> or the Pareto principle to be more specific on that. Yeah, well, so this is between the VC and the entrepreneur because the entrepreneur has got one bet and the VC's got 30. So mm. there's a different attitude to risk. There's mm. a just different, pro- there's one of the VC has a portfolio. Mm. So I think I come to the main subject of the day. So I want to talk about your new presentation, the new gatekeepers, and also borrowing from one of your really old essays called New Questions on Mobile. Today, I want to have a new questions on AI conversation with you. I think I will start yeah. off with the new gatekeepers. When I was reading your presentation from year to year as an audience thinking about it, I always think about the key questions that you're trying to address for that presentation for that year. So maybe for this year, I'm quite curious, what are the key questions or the narrative which you want your audience to actually understand or at least take away from that presentation itself? I think there was a couple of things that I was thinking about there. I mean, there's obviously a sort of, if I'm going to go to a room full of people and say, this is what's interesting in tech, the stuff you have to talk about. So you have to talk about the macro environment and you have to talk about, well, what is it that's coming next? And where what was that metaverse thing and that crypto thing? And what's this new AI thing? And so those are the bookends for the presentation, partly because when I made it, it was not entirely clear what this AI thing was going to be. I mean, it's still not clear, but it was much less clear. And this is in January, December, January. The major part of the presentation is really a presentation about e-commerce, retail, advertising, marketing, TV, brand. So the sort of interlocking nexus of $25 trillion of global retail, plus brands, plus TV, plus advertising and marketing. Advertising is what, and marketing combined are what, one, one and a half trillion dollars. What is it that we buy? How do we buy it? Why do we decide? How do people persuade us? How do people give it to us? How does this work? And there's maybe three things within that. The first is that in the pre-internet world, which we are still slowly transitioning out of, you have two fundamental objectives. You have, how do I get the product? And how do I know the product exists? And you serve the customer. How do you sell to the customer? So you've got logistics, and then you've got recommendation, curation, discovery, expertise. And of course, like a physical retail store is very often doing both of those to some degree. Chanel Boutique is doing a lot of recommendation and curation. The supermarket Mm. isn't doing very much. It's basically logistics. And any retailer is doing some combination of those. And then any brand is choosing what mix it it does of those. But what happens increasingly, I think, with the internet is that the barriers between those two break down much more. And so now you might say, should we open stores in that country or just advertise there? Should we put more money into shipping or free returns or pricing or Instagram or TV or stores? And so all of the different budgets, basically everything below Procter & Gamble's gross margin line becomes one question in a way that it maybe wasn't really quite, those weren't really separate questions in the past. You couldn't really say, well, should we have stores or just do TVS? Well, no, no, that wasn't a choice. Mm. Now it becomes a choice. I think the second thing that I want to talk about was, again, a two-way split, that in the sort of physical world, you have a fundamental physical constraint on how much inventory there can be and so how much product there can be. Like, how many products can you have in a store? I mean, even a supermarket, a typical typical American supermarket, I think stocks about 50,000 SKUs. And that's up from about 5,000 30 or 40 years ago, basically because of computers that let you do stock cake, manage the stock and know what you had. So you've got 50,000 SKUs and Amazon has, pick a number, 500 million SKUs. 
So the physical barrier on how much product there could be is gone. And meanwhile, of course, the physical constraint on how much media and communication and advertising and marketing there can be is also gone because you no longer have like a finite number of edit top TV slots. Before mm. the internet, okay, how many people can do a nationwide TV ad? How many people can buy the back page of Vogue? How many people can buy the back page of the South China Morning Post? Well, there is a basic constraint on communication story and a basic constraint on the, the physical on physical inventory. And both of those are gone. Mm. So you have infinite product and infinite media in this world also in which the way that media are doing the internet and, the, and, and, and the, that they were merging into one. And so this means sort of as a brand you and as a consumer, there's this sort of blank canvas. I mean, as a consumer, like, it's a joke, isn't it? You can't go to Amazon and what do you buy? Like, you have to know before you get that. Amazon is at the bottom of the funnel, as opposed to you go into a, like my sort of favorite example is there's a bookshop in Tokyo that just sells one book, like actually one mm. book. And they change it like once a week. But you have to know that the bookshop exists. So you go into the shop, you don't have to work out what to buy, but you have to have decided I'm going to go to that shop and buy whatever they're selling. So you've got this sort of question of, well, how is it that I would know what to buy in this world of infinite media? The third thing that I've talked about is those two things mean we've got this explosion in new companies. And you could point to Netflix on one hand and to Shein on the other. But it seems to me that the common thing between Netflix and Shein is that Netflix is a TV company, not a tech company, in the sense that all the questions that matter for Netflix are TV questions. Like what TV shows? What right structure? What's the exploitation window? What do you pay the script? What do you pay the writers? What do you pay the stars? What happens if there's no well, now that there's no syndication, so there's no show at the back end? I don't know. I don't even know the questions. They're all TV questions. Mm. Should they buy sports? That's all other bunch of questions, but they're all TV questions and sports questions. They're not tech questions. Like what happens to sports rights in streaming? That's a TV question. Nobody in TV knows either, but that's a TV mm. question. It's the same thing for shit. All the questions that matter for Shein are power questions, like what happens to the procurement system? How do they persuade consumers that this is sustainable? How do they manage the design? Like they're all power questions. There's no tech questions here. And the reason that they are able to have five to 10,000 new products every day is because they don't have a network of stores. That's not a tech issue. That's a retailing question. And so the point that I was getting at there is that like an awful lot of what happens as all, everything about retail and media and brand unbundled, is that you have new entrants, not tech companies getting into this space. I notice that Google and it is not commissioning new TV shows. Facebook is not commissioning TV shows. Google has YouTube. YouTube is a tech business. They don't, buy, they don't get LA and buy LA stuff. They run a social network. But what happens much more is that, that this is a new channel that enables new companies to enter existing industries. So you have new apparel companies, new car companies, new TV companies, new furniture companies, new kinds of restaurants. But the questions are all for that industry, not from tech. If I were to just take a second to just close into that thought, right? When you think about the old and the new gatekeepers, is it coming from a more constrained world to a world with infinite supply and demand? And then at the same time, those what you call, what you think may be technology companies that actually have became uh, traditional companies like a Shein and Netflix, for example. Netflix is just yeah, none other than another TV channel like Disney Plus, for example. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, Disney Plus is like, uh, Netflix is Sky. It's a satellite business, in effect. And the interesting thing about to talk about gatekeepers is that, again, in 1990, there are there's two department stores in the city. There's two newspapers and there's five TV channels. And today, yes, Amazon is a much bigger company and Google is a much bigger company, but that's because they, they are in every city. But Amazon has 500 million SKUs. So what gatekeeper is it exactly? It's not really making any choices about what it sells. 60% of what's sold at Amazon is sold by Amazon Vent Marketplace. So Amazon is, isn't even selling it. It's somebody else selling it. YouTube has however many million videos uploaded every day. They're not deciding what's on YouTube. I mean, they're not even really deciding what people watch. Yes, there's a recommend the recommendation algorithm drives the viewing, but nobody at YouTube is sitting down and saying, oh, we think we should give Mr. Beast more views today. And it's purely a function of the recommendation system. And so it's sort of interesting, you know, the same thing with Apple, we've got this famous idea that sort of Apple is closed. Well, yes, but it's got a couple of million apps and how many hundred billion downloads? So in what sense exactly is that closed? It's got more software than Linux. 
like far more software than Linux. So is it closed? Mm. Well, it depends what you mean by closed at what level of abstraction. And so the part of the point of the of the title is almost to say, yes, you've got these gatekeepers, but they don't work like the old gatekeepers at all. They're actually completely out of the way. Mm. Well, they they no longer basically decide what to go out or what not to go out, but they have a different way of helping the, the customer discover or curate whatever specifically that they are looking for. Maybe that's the way I would think about it as that customer looking into these gatekeepers today. Yeah, it's a very different model and a much more automated and scaled model. If you are selling something in a department store, well, first of all, you're going to need to get a meeting with somebody there and they're going to need to buy it from you. And then if there's a problem, there's going to be meetings and phone calls. You don't need to get a meeting at Amazon for your product to be listed on to be sold through Amazon. On the other hand, Amazon isn't going to put it in front of the doors in the middle of Causeway Bay or in the middle of London or in the middle of New York. You're going to have to go out and get people to buy it from them. So it's mm. just a very different concept of what it means to be controlling what people buy. So do you think that the pandemic is actually the thing that accelerate the demise of all these old gatekeepers? Because like given digital transformation in the last two year, two, three years are actually more than the last decade because Sasha Nadella say so. Yeah, I mean, digital transformation is a different, actually a different topic. I mean, digital transformation is much more, I mean, again, it's a ridiculous phrase, but it's actually much more about enterprise software. Mm. No, I think there was a moment when people looked at some charts and thought, oh my God, we're getting like 20 years of e-commerce adoption in six months. And what sort of actually happened was we got three or four years, but then it reverted back to the trend line. And so it looks like we basically what's happening is we're all on the same trend line that we were on in 2019. We just jumped forward a bit and then we're mm. carrying on back onto the line. I mean, obviously the some sectors that did jump forward, like, like grocery delivery did double and kind of hold at that level. I mean, the UK is a market I'm most familiar with. UK, it went from 5% to 10%. The US, I think it went from 2.5% to 5%. So it's mm. sort of similar. And it's, and it's stayed at that level. No, I mean, I think the way I would look at the pandemic is it's much more kind of psychological that it broke it broke all of our habits. So it broke the presumption that that's not a Zoom call. I mean, like I worked for Andreessen Horowitz for six years. I think we did one video call, like if that, like maybe two. So the presumption that video calls are weird and the code completely exceptional is just gone. And everyone had to try doing online grocery or ordering food online or buying that from Amazon instead of going to the store. So I think what it did really was sort of break the habits and crystallize the realization that this was happening much more than it actually created a step change in the actual numbers. So I think one thing that really draws out from the whole presentation is Amazon, because I'm formerly now an Amazonian looking at this. So yep. the way how you presented it was to talk about the story of Amazon as a new gatekeeper. So there is the e-commerce piece where they have infinite skills, I would say, almost, cloud computing and advertising. What is their story as a new gatekeeper, is it just basically that facilitation of skill that you mentioned earlier? Or is there something new that even that we have not seen, given that now they, they are basically a new gatekeeper across three different forms of three old gatekeepers doing the three things, but now it's all aggregated into one? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that Jeff Bezos has like an encyclopedia of retail from about 1975 <laughs> in a safe behind his desk. And it's full of post-it notes. And he's just working his way through page by page. And every now and then it, it can be really hilarious because people will see something that Amazon is doing and be amazed or horrified or outraged. And what Amazon is doing is something that every retailer has done for 100 years or 150 years, like private label. And this is mm -hmm. my favorite example of this. Like private label is anything from 10 to 50% of pretty much every big retailer and mm. has been for 100 years. But then when Amazon does private label, and it, incidentally, it, it appears to only be like 2 or 3% of their revenue. Oh my God, have you seen what Amazon's doing? They're copying other products and they're looking at the data to see what sells and copying the products. Like, yeah. You, have you ever been to, to a supermarket? Haven't you seen them doing that? And so I think there's a sort of a lot of what Amazon does is running what retailers do step by step. I think in particular, what, one of the things I talked about in the presentation was retail media which I think is mm. it's actually a fascinating conversation of old and new. So for anyone who doesn't know, Amazon sells ads, it search ads on the website. You search for something, ads appear. Yeah. And that last year was about $38 billion, $40 billion in the last 12 months. That segment overall might be 10% of global advertising now. 
because lots of other people are doing it too. I think Walmart had almost $3 billion last year. Uber is at a half billion dollar run rate. There's lots of people doing this. So maybe $100 billion in total with Amazon having sort of 40 of that. And there's a bunch of ways you can look at this. So one of them is you can say like, this has got fantastic margins. Alphabet's ad business, if you strip out TAC, is like a 60% operating margin business. Retailers are like a 20% margin business. So there's sort of a quote in the presentation from the chief executive of Walmart basically saying, oh my God, look at these margins. And of course, if you're a 3% margin business, if you add like a relatively, an ad business, it's a relatively small percentage of your top line, could be a very large percentage of your bottom line. Now, of course, that's one part that drives it. The other parts that drive it are firstly, a website is inventory in a way that a store isn't. So like suddenly you realize, no, actually we could have ads where in a supermarket you can't in the same way. Well, not nearly as obviously. But also, of course, it's a push to first party data. The cookie apocalypse, push to privacy, push against targeting. Well, as a retailer, at the very least, you can show a search ad because they search for that. And you may well have logged in data. You've got information about what else they bought, where they live, something about their income. Guess what? Mm-hmm. Like, again, like tracking mm-hmm. isn't exactly new. So that all becomes relatively much more valuable. And so that's sort of the, driven this sort of wave of merchant media. But of course, you can also look at this and say this is trade dollars or this is marketing or this is a slotting fee, which again is something that retailers have done for 100 years. Or you could look at it and say, this is price discrimination. Right? This is what this is actually about, is that it's a way to get Prot from Gamble to pay more margin. And it's a way to get the vendors to bid for a lower margin, to vendors to look at their ROI and decide what price they will give Amazon and still make a profit, rather than Amazon having to haggle one supplier at a time they just say, look, you decide what your profit is and you what you can afford to pay to appear in the search results. So they're sort of automating the bargaining process with their suppliers. So maybe the follow-up question which I want to ask, and this has been on my mind reading your presentation, is how will Amazon be disrupted as a gatekeeper? Because a gatekeeper is basically having certain modes for a pretty long time. Just look at the old gatekeepers before Amazon came in as the new gatekeeper. Mm-hmm. So if, say, 50 years later, and if we're still having this conversation, what would be the thing that in that future to think about? How does this gatekeeper be taken away then? Would, because now so, you have well, infinite skills, you get infinite content as well. Yeah. yeah. There are a narrow and a broad answer to this. And the narrow answer would be, look at something like Shopify unbundling Amazon. And indeed, think back and look at Walmart. You know, I don't think anybody today would believe that well, Walmart will just swallow all retail. What happens is that people decide they want to be in an aggregator or they decide they want to go direct. Nike in the last 10 or 15 years has shifted from selling almost entirely through third-party retailers to now, I think, selling 40 45% of the Nike brand product is sold through Nike's own channel, through its own stores and its own website. So there's always that. It's the classic Jim Barksdale quote, the two ways to make money are bundling and unbundling. So one answer is, well, is absolutely every form of online commerce going to go through Amazon? No, of course not. And no more than it goes through Walmart. I think the broader answer would be Amazon beat Google at product search. Google beat Microsoft at the internet. Microsoft built and beat IBM at computing. But IBM is still around and it's actually still a pretty big company. And Microsoft Mm -hmm. is certainly a big company, even though they lost the internet and then lost mobile but they carried on selling Windows and Office. And the IBM IBM lost the PC and lost the GUI and was gone by the time the internet arrived, never mind mobile. And yet they carried on selling big iron to enterprises and consulting services around that. And IBM's install base of mainframe compute capacity is still growing. Every now and then they give indications of what the the compute capacity is it measured in MIPS, and it's still growing. Like, here we are all these years after the IBM 360 was launched in 1965. So... What tends to happen is that the new thing doesn't actually replace the old thing. It just becomes much bigger. It becomes a separate market. It creates a separate and much bigger market. I mean, imagine this is like 2005 and we're looking at social and we're saying, well, obviously Google is going to win because they've got all the user data. Like, sorry, Mark Zuckerberg, you're screwed. Well, it didn't work out like that. (laughs) Mm. What happened was that Facebook created this whole other business separate to Google. Mm. So I think we have experience a year where we have this metaverse web tree and went from darlings of tech now this dog house and of course it might change because uh, bitcoin and ethereum prices are changing thanks to the speculators i think what i want to know is from you and this is a question because i only saw one slide on it is what 
what are the mental models I need to have now if I'm thinking about building, say, a Web3 or crypto application or maybe Matt, or something to do with augmented reality and VR? So I think a problem with particularly Metaverse and to some extent Web3 is that these terms sort of became so broad and became used by anybody to mean anything. And so you don't, it's not actually possible to know today what somebody means if they say metaverse. I literally, I just don't know what somebody would mean. If I hear someone say metaverse, I don't know what they mean. Though. What do you mean? Do you mean, do you mean games? Do you mean AR? Do you mean some portability of assets between Facebook and TikTok? Do you mean NFTs? Like, what do you mean? Like, it, it, the world has become meaningless. Web3, in, I think, slightly similar, not quite so bad. But again, people can use Web3 now to mean anything involving crypto, which I don't think is what it was originally supposed to mean. And so if I kind of give very narrow descriptions of both of these, I won't talk about Metaverse, I'll talk about VR and AR. Mm. And, and then I'll talk about Web3. So distinguishing VR and AR, VR, you wear this headset, we now are sort of where mobile was in the mid 2000s. We've got great devices. There's nothing wrong with them. You can use it and give it to a friend. You don't say, oh, it's only a prototype. You remember it's not finished yet. No, it works. But it's clearly not that we clearly do not have VR devices that billions of people are going to use as their main computing device. Or indeed that billions of people are going to buy it all. And so then there's a question is there's one view is, well, five years of more of engineering, like better just better display, better sensor, better GPUs, better control systems. And then it will all just become apparent that it's just more force of will. And like, the reasons to use this other than games will break out. And this will become something that half a billion, a billion, two, three billion people use. The bear case is that if I'd shown you a PlayStation 5 30 years ago, you would have said, oh my God, this is amazing. This is a future. And guess what? The install base of games consoles globally is 200 to 250 million units. And so it's not a small market, but it's not smartphones. Like most people don't play, certainly don't play AAA games. And actually, I would argue most people don't really play games at all. Like there's maybe a billion or two people who play puzzle games on their smartphone, but that's not telling you that all those people are going to get VR headsets. They're mm. playing solid, they're playing a puzzle game on their smartphone on the subway. Like that's not the same thing as playing deep, rich, immersive games in VR. And it's not clear that would change. And so the bear case for VR is like it's a deep, rich and narrow immersive experience. It's the new games console and maybe even a subset of games consoles. And it won't matter how much better it gets. Because games consoles did not break out to get to billions of people with better graphics. Like no one cares. You, you look at it and you say, that's very pretty. I'm not interested. Mm. So that's sort of like the where we are with VR, which is like it, it works, but most people don't care. And is that going to change? And that might be the hardware. It might be like inventing or creating new use cases. But the problem is the use cases require people to buy the hardware. So there's a sort of catch-22 there. Whereas smartphones, like all they had to do was replace the existing mobile phone that you had anyway. So you didn't have to persuade people to buy a completely different device and separate device. With AR, it's much more science problem, which is the dream of AR is, I mean, yes, you have pals through on VR headsets and so on, but the dream of AR is you are wearing something that looks like this and I don't have a screen in front of me. I think the screen just appears. And, you know, I'm walking down the street and you call me and I see like the whole of you, like 3D standing next to me. Like that's the dream. We don't have the optics to do that. We sort of have to have the optics to do it through a window like this in a dark room, which is HoloLens and Magic Leap and a few other things besides. It's not clear that anyone has the optics to make that work in something that looks like this, that will walk, work as I walk down the street. It's, we don't, I don't know, maybe somebody at Apple or Google knows. I don't think it's public that we have a past getting that. And so without that, what is this? Is this, is it like a Google Glass? Is it a heads up display? What is Apple going to launch at WWGC? Will they? A, a, a VR headset with occlusion, with cameras on, like I can see working, wearing that at home. I can't see somebody wearing that all day. So that doesn't feel like a universal device. And so that's the puzzle. Now, then if you had this, then you have other questions, like lots of other questions, like, is that actually the right UI or is it just better to have a screen? But like, given we don't have anything that's academic. Now, the Web3 conversation, the way that I would define, understand Web3 is that you have three waves of Bitcoin. 
or blockchain. Wave one is Bitcoin, which is basically a digital bearer currency. It's digital gold, or it's a digital T-bill, or whatever you want to call it, not a zero interest rate. It's, it's a digital bearer instrument. And so if you live in Argentina or Syria or Lebanon, then the idea that you could put your life savings on a USB stick is actually quite appealing. And it, the idea that it can't deflate and the government can't screw it up and the bank can't disappear, that's actually quite appealing. For most of the, and if your grandparents fled from China in 19, the late 1940s, again, the idea that you can put your entire net worth on a, on a USB stick and get on a boat is appealing. Mm. If you lived in a country that hasn't had a bank run for the last 100 years or where people don't lose their money like that, then this seems like a weird eccentric thing that, that doesn't that make most people in most countries don't have that problem. Now, yes, you can talk about the unbanked in emerging markets and all that. We could have that conversation. But this is not going to persuade like normal people in Britain or Spain or Canada. Oh, my God, I'm going to do this instead. It just doesn't solve a problem that, that these people have. So then the second step is to say, well, what if you can put some scripting on this? So then you could make like an escrow system or a lending system or a credit card system. You can make a payment system on it. You could build, you could solve things like real estate transfers. Mm. And that's basically what that's what we call DeFi. And that's what blew up last year, or some of some of what blew up last year was DeFi. Some of it wasn't. I mean, FTX is not DeFi. FTX is just an mm. exchange. And you could have done that in 1970 with stocks and bonds. That's a very old-fashioned screw-up. It's nothing, nothing particularly specific to crypto about FTX. But things like Terra Luna, say, like that's a, that's a, a DeFi thing, arguably a DeFi thing. Anyway, that's sort of a second wave of stuff. It's a bit more interesting. Web3 says, well, if you can put scripting on this put stuff, you could put real software on this. And say so you should think of a blockchain as a sort of distributed open source computer. Open in the sense, not just that you can see the code, but in the sense that you can see it as it's running. And so the way I used to describe this is that if I stand next to a motorway, next to a freeway, I trust that the cars won't hit me. But if I stand next to a train track, I know the cars won't, the train won't hit me because I can see the track. In fact, I can stand in the middle of the junction and look at the junction and know I won't get hit. And so you could build Instagram on this. Or you could build YouTube on this, or you could build Twitter on this. And of course, back to what I said earlier, like the new thing is never the old thing, but on the new architecture, you could build a, a billion scale social network on a blockchain. And if you did that, then it would work differently in lots of interesting ways. So for example, the users collectively would have votes. So the management couldn't just change how it worked. The users collect. Now that creates other problems. And if you are an influencer and you post an ad, well, the advertiser puts some money in an escrow address on the chain, and you can see it's there. So you can everyone else. And you run your ad, and the advertiser can see the metrics in the ad because that's all on the chain too. And the escrow system can automatically release the money based on the contract, based on the metrics, and you can see the contract. You can see the contract in the escrow system. You can see the code. You can see the parameters. You can see, well, when I hit these numbers, then that software will transfer me this money. And that's very sort of seductive and appealing, sometimes in a practical way, sometimes in a sort of very religious way. Web3 is very religious. Right? There's a lot of ideolo ideology on it. It reminds mm. me a lot of open source in that sense. You remember all the open source people thought that soft mm, for yeah. software was evil. And Microsoft was evil. And we're going to destroy Microsoft because buying software is morally wrong. And there's a lot of that in crypto as well. The challenge in that Web3, with that, that Web3 thesis is Right now, it's like talking about Amazon in 1989. Like, there's no web, there's no SSL, there's no HTTP. Nobody's got a browser, and the browsers, and nobody's got a, a modem, and the modems that exist run at like 9.6k or less, 2.6k or something. And you're trying to create Netflix. And yeah, it won't take 20 years. But it's also not going to happen this year. There's an awful, an, an awful lot of like the actual work that goes on is trying to create all the three and four letter acronyms that got built for the internet in the 80s and 90s. It's trying to create that crypto. Um, mm. Because there is no HTTP. There's no SMTP. There's no IMAP. There's no SSL. There's none of those. There's no ADSL. There's none of those acronyms that, make, that mean that you can then go out and do Instagram with five people. Can I ask a rather in-depth question here? Because the way I think about Web3 is that the way any asset in the world looks like has an embedded capital market that sits in. And because of that, 
you would basically create not just the builder and people who funds it, but now you have an additional group of people called speculators that actually make yeah. this asset very different. Like for example, the open source model, right? This particular new way of thinking brings in new tools and new types of users. And is that the way that's going to be in terms of thinking that what to build there rather than trying to think of everything and try to map back to what this can do? as in finding the analogies for that matter. You know, I gave it a very, probably sounded long to anyone listening, but it's actually a brief and very schematic sense of, of, of what goes on in blockchain. Yeah, part of the founding mechanic of blockchain is this idea of, of Bitcoin, which is the, the original, is this idea, like, how do you jumpstart a network? How do you get people to use it when nobody's using it? Like, how, how do you get somebody to buy a fax machine when no one else has a fax machine? And the thesis is that you give the early adopters an economic share, an economic stake, proportionate to when they join. And so it's as though Instagram could have given stock to the users proportionate to how early they joined or proportionate to how much engagement they drove or how much value they drove, maybe. Mm. And as it grows, you get less and less and less and you reach a point that becomes de minimis. So it's not a Ponzi scheme or pyramid scheme per se. Like once you've got 10 million users, like the next user gets like an infinitesimally small amount of stock or maybe none at all. But that's an incentive to get people using it. Now, the problem with this, which is what we saw over the last couple of years, is that now the traction for your product might be actual users or it might just be people speculating that other people are going to use it. So you've got all these people active on your system, none of whom actually care about it at all. They just think that other people might care about it. So it's difficult to work out what to build. And meanwhile, the people with votes are not the people who would use it. They're the people who think other people will use it, maybe. Maybe. Mm. So this is what I alluded to earlier. Now, what, now the idea, you know, yet you, you, okay, you build an Instagram on a blockchain. Okay, that creates a whole bunch of questions. One of them is as a speculator, the right people to give votes to. How do you design a product when your users are speculators, not users? How do you deal with sort of misalignment of incentives between the people who have an economic stake and maybe all the later users? What happens if like the first 5% of people have got all the votes in this peak? How do you structure that? And this reminds me a little bit, people in the 18th century trying to design like ideal constitutions. We'll design our constitution mm. such that we'll never have tyranny. We'll have two chambers and then we'll have judges and judges are elected for a year and they have to be celibate. And then we'll we'll have a king who's elected for 18 months and he has to step down. And like all these fantasy constitutions people draw up. And if mm. you go back and look at the history of Latin America in the 19th and 20th century or the or indeed Africa in the, the last sort of 75 years, you discover that you can make the constitution, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee that everything works the way you thought it was going to work. I would also like look at Germany or Italy or Austria in the 20th century. And so then, you, of course, you can have a whole other conversation, which is, like, is it actually a good idea to essentially effectively create a tradable market in every interaction on your system? Like, is it if, if every like has financial value, that will change how people use the system and <laughs> not necessarily in good ways, but it will certainly change what people, how people use the system. And are you set up to manage that? And if you've given the users all the votes, who's, what happens, then you're not going to be able, who is it that's going to decide, oh, shit, this isn't working right? Who's mm. in charge? Which goes back again to the, the democracy point. You don't need a king, but you need a president or somebody who can make decisions. You can't run every decision on the basis of a referendum. So you get all sorts of governance questions and incentive structure questions if once you start saying, oh, I'm going to build Instagram and blockchain. Okay, I will, I will take that as a question that I should be reading more history of constitution books, which I'm actually doing a lot when I'm thinking about a blockchain. But I want to get to the last part of the conversation, which is also the last part of your presentation, which is the dreams of the future that led to the current AI wave. Can I just get your perspective on this? When you unlock ChatGPT or maybe generative AI as a whole, is this, to me, mm -hmm. is it the iPhone moment, paradigm shift, or just... At the current wave, because I talk to a lot of the investors around my region of geography, the inflated expectations part of the hype cycle, like what you see, the VCs are just being optimistic. They say that we should just fund everything, but you know, there's only one out of 10 and hoping that one will break out. 
So a sort of narrow answer, a general answer, this is actually very difficult to invest in for a VC at the moment because it's very unclear at a sort of a base level whether we're going to have a model of like a relatively small number of very large, very expensive models with everything else as sort of commodity on top. So it's very unclear, like, well, what is it going to cost? What are the moats going to be? Where, how does the value chain and the stack look like? So it's actually very hard to invest in this as a VC. You're here talking from actual VC friends. But kind of to wind back a second, is this the iPhone? I would say there's sort of three levels of enthusiasm in this. There's a sort of base case, which is, this is a second wave of AI, and AI has been an enormous deal in the last 10 years. This is sort of the iPhone moment in that this is a generational shift, and this is what all the, every what new tech company will be based around for the next five or 10 years. So basically, for the, from sort of 2010 to 2020, you know, most consumer tech companies were in one way or another shaped by the iPhone, either directly building for it or shaped by the fact that everyone had it. But the iPhone was like the central fact of tech for 10 years. And before that, it was the web for sort of 10 years or 15 years. And so the, the base case is, okay, this is sort of the basic thing that shapes how tech functions for the next 5, 10, 15 years. I don't think there's many people that don't think that. Now, the more aggressive view, which I sort of heard Bill Gates articulate very well, is Bill Gates said, like, when I went and saw a GUI at Xerox Park for the first time in the late 70s, I thought to myself, this is a step change in who can use a computer, because now you don't have to use a command line. So you don't have to learn to use a command line. So this is a huge change in how many people can use a computer. However, somebody still has to write the software. So it's this software that has a GUI. Someone has to write Office or Photoshop or InDesign or whatever the application is. Or you have to pay somebody to write it for you, or you have to learn to write code. So that's still a, an issue. And with an LLM, potentially you can just ask the thing to make it for you. So you have a step change in what in the accessibility of software, in what software can be, in who can have software made for them and how. Because if, if I, I mean, a trivial example, one of the things I would like to do is get a good time series of people in the US who worked in jobs like data entry or stenographers or typists or telephone operators or copying machine operators or mm. filing clerks, all the jobs that basically went away as a result of computing in the last 50 years. And that data all exists in lots of different PDFs and tables on the US Census website. But there's really no way that you can get it without mastering four or five different APIs and writing quite a lot of code. Now, I ought to be able to say to chat GPT, either A, just go and pull the data out of all of those PDFs, or B, please write me the code and run it. Today, you can't. And the sort of three basic LLM questions, number one is, does this take us to AGI? Number two is... How long is it going to be this expensive and how does that change? And number three is what is what happens to the error rate? Because right now, if you go to GPT-4, which is like the, the new one, and say, write me a biography of Benedict Evans and then hit read load three times, you'll get biographies of three slightly different people. Like I went to Oxford, no Cambridge, no LSE. My first job was in consulting, no banking, no journalism. No, then I went and worked for Enders Analysis, no Goldman Sachs, no Atlas Ventures. Right. <laughs> And these are all, I mean, I think people misunderstand this when you, you call it bullshit or people with word hallucination. What's happening here is it's matching a pattern. It's saying this is the pattern of your question and these are patterns of answers that would match the pattern of your question. And those slowly converge on truth, quote unquote, but they're not there yet. And they don't seem to be converging on truth very quickly. GPT-4 is whatever it is, and however many orders of magnitude bigger than GPT-3.5, and the error rate really didn't change very much. And so if I go to Go if I go to Bing and say, what are the symptoms of appendicitis? The answer might be right. It's probably right, but I can't tell, and it matters. And so that's the third question is, what do you do with this, given that error rate and given the cost of it? Mm. And it seems to me that all the use cases are going to be vertical, and that actually the one thing you can't do with it is general search, at least until we have a much better sense of how you manage that error rate.
I want to take back just now that question when I asked you about Web3 and talk about that capital markets as a fee, as like the speculators as part of that new thing that's added in. It feels to me it can be a feature and can be a bug. So now I'm going to flip that same question and ask you about hallucinations. I, when, when you think about that's what you have just said, right? When I think about generative AI as a builder, because he, and also a person who's familiar with machine learning as well, do I actually build on top of it as a feature rather than thinking of it as a bug? I think the current preview understanding of a lot of people who are covering this or looking at it is, is thinking of it as a bug or the error rate as you, you rightfully call it. This is almost a very philosophical question. I find it much easier to understand what's going on if you look at images rather than text. And I think part of the problem with NLP, natural language processing, is that the natural language processing doesn't have an error rate. The natural language processing always produces grammatically correct sentences now. But it's producing doing gra grammatically correct sentences that of an underlying model that's wrong, that isn't always correct. Do you see what I mean? Yes, I Whereas glorified when grammar checker. Image, yeah, whereas when you make images, you can see the mistakes in the underlying model much more easily. And like the obvious example that everyone loves to use is legs. So mm. can I share a screen with you? Yeah, okay. sure. Happy to. Um, so I asked for advertising people on a panel on a beach in Cannes, at Cannes Line. So let's talk about this. We're on a beach. Looks like they, it's not quite, I mean, there shouldn't really be a big audience like that behind. Um, but these are people on a panel. Look at the clothes and the haircuts. These look like advertising people. They're not bankers. They're not pop, pop music. They are advertising people. They're on a panel. A woman's holding a microphone. They're in a panel. They're waiting like they're on a beach. The chairs, those are Eames Eiffel chairs with the right legs. Look at this, the, the, the fourth guy along. Look at his legs. Yep. <laughs> there are three legs there. So... Yep. It doesn't know what legs are. It knows that sort of shapes like that tend to be associated with other shapes like that. So it's doing pattern recognition, but it's making a pattern without actually knowing what the pattern is. And the more data in the bed of the models, the more it will converge with that. But it will never actually know in the sort of structured logical sense that people never have three legs. It only knows that people are very unlikely to have three legs. And of course, this is like, we haven't really talked about like, the, the basics of how machine learning works, but like the whole point of machine learning is that what people tried to do before was build systems that knew that it had three and people have two legs. Hmm. People try to build logical systems. And the problem is that never worked because it turns out the number of logical steps you would need to encode for it to be able to make this image is like a billion. Like it's just completely impossible for people to encode all these logical steps. And like the breakthrough of machine learning is you make it a statistics problem and you tell the computer to do the work. Instead of instead of human beings trying to write the logical steps, you get the computer to write the logical steps. But the problem is it's doing that on a statistical basis. And so the existential question around both the error rate and also, frankly, AGI is, and this is a very crude non-AI scientist way of putting it, but like as the models get better, will sort of innate structural understanding emerge spontaneously? Or will they not? And they will never get that structural understanding. And or is it that people don't have that structural understanding either? We just think we do because our model is really good. So you have like sort of Stephen Wolfram, for example, looking at chat GPT and saying, well, maybe what this is telling us is that language is a lot less complex than we think. And our brains are less complicated than we think. So you've got these two parts. So there's one theory that says, look, maybe this is this has no structural understanding. Maybe we don't either. It's just our model is like a thousand times bigger. And when you get to that scale, and obviously you can then make a list of cognitive distances and all the different logical fallacies that people tend to make, like the way we don't understand probability or optical illusions, like our own brains have got lots of sort of things that they screw up, up as well. And so maybe what it is, is our model is basically like this, but a thousand times bigger or hundred times bigger, whatever it is, something like that, which is what gets you to people saying, oh shit, this might get us AGI. 
like just give it 100x more compute and like maybe we'll get AGI out of this. Now, there's a the second argument says no, because we have innate structural understanding and these things don't. The third argument is like, may, no, maybe we don't. Maybe we don't have that understanding or maybe these things will get it as the models get bigger. Maybe that's how we get it. We just having a bigger model will give you this. And then you go, you can spend like, you can spend a week of your life watching videos of scientists arguing about this. And the answer is no one knows. Really, nobody knows. But that's the API argument at one extreme is if you actually solve the error rate in all use cases, that sounds to me like, well, the, if solving the error rate in any given use case might be AGI, or it might be that you solve the error rate, error rate by the system saying, I don't know what to do here. But it's sort of easier to say, I don't know what to do here in text and an image. What would the I don't know what to do here be in this case? It, it, it sounds to me, sorry, this is probably as a person who had done machine learning, write the algorithms on my end of the spectrum. The error rate is something that you can never get to zero. It's a little bit like in thermodynamics, there's this third law saying that yeah, yeah, cool. there is no absolute zero. Absolute. You will never get there. What, yeah. happens, what happens, how close can you get? Yeah. And again, that's what I sort of said earlier. As soon as you start going vertical, A, you might be able to get the error rate much lower. B, you can create product and interface around that to reflect mm. that. And C, the user will know. So if you use GPT to write a sales email, for a senior salesperson, it can save them 10 minutes and then they can look at it and fix it. Right. The problem is if you use it for Bing and you say, I've got a really bad pain in my stomach. What are the symptoms of appendicitis? Like, I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to be able to look at the result and tell you whether it's correct or not. So if I were to take that very philosophical part that we just talked about, and then think about applications from generative AI, wouldn't we be looking for applications that doesn't have something like very precise, but are able to give us certain variations of, say, something that's optimized around some error rate, which we do yeah. not know about? Maybe that's the way we should be thinking that's... about AI applications. Yeah, so this is two answers here. One of them is, that was not a very creative image, but uh, hang on, why don't I? And again, I am not... A, I'm not a visual, particularly visual person. I'm not a, this is not my field, but I was experimenting and I said, make me some Italian, make me some vintage French sports cars. So if you are brainstorming to make a 60s spy movie, okay, I'll use that. I'll think about that. Don't like that one. Let's go back to this one. Okay, it's got two steering wheels and no door. <laughs> Who cares? I don't care. I'm brainstorming to make a movie for production design for a movie. I don't care that there's no door. I can add the door. And so that's, that's the other side is either the, you can fix the error or you don't care about the error. It doesn't matter. But more generally, like one of the ways that I described this, I used to describe the last wave of AI, machine learning was it gives you infinite interns. So like you're a bank, you want to listen to every call that comes into the call center and tell me if the customer sounds nervous. Listen to every call and tell me if our staff member is rude. Well, you don't need an expert to do that. You could get like a 10-year-old to do that. You can get an intern to do that. But you don't have enough interns to listen to every call. Well, now you do. Machine mm -hmm. learning is infinite interns. Now, to the same sales email scenario, like write me 50 sales emails. Come back. Except it doesn't take all week. It's like, okay, okay, I'm going through Salesforce. Okay, I need to write an email here. Press go. Okay, that. Okay, that's no. I'll fix that and fix that. Press end. It's an intern. Now, of course, the joke in the scenario I just outlined is that half of LLMs will be turning three bullet points into a two hundred word email, and the other half of the LLMs will be turning two hundred word emails into fifty bullet points. Into bullet points. So you basically have two email, two LLMs talking to each other. Like I'll write down three bullet points that I want to send to you, and you'll get a thousand word email, and you'll give it to an LLM and say so summarize this, and it'll give you three bullet points. You might as well just send. Send a bullet points. <laughs> okay. I, I want to go to just three very quick questions. The, my first one is actually, there's a conversation I recently have with uh, Rima who says that uh, why China missed the invention of ChatGPT. And one argument was because the people in China, because of resource constraints, didn't go full research mode with LLMs. And once OpenAI started this, they went full-blown. So actually every Chinese 
top startups are raising 100, 200 million to build their LLMs to gain control for that yep. market because of the language. I think the, the last time when we had this conversation, one and a half years ago, we talked about the layers that you can build on. That means it's open or closed. Maybe the question actually I want to frame on, and when the US side now, what happens is that most people are either building on top of open AIs, chat GPT or auto GPT, or maybe Google's bot, or maybe someone else, Amazon's LLM, who is just released as well. And they built on top of it. Maybe the question I really want to condense to is, how should we think about AI as layers on which we build and not build on? I think that is a much more interesting question than whether we should be building LLMs. So as I sort of go back to what I said earlier, sort of basic LLM questions, number one, AGI, number two, error rate, number three, cost. Mm. And model is, 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 there is this nexus of, okay, are you going to need stupendously large model with stupendously large compute cost and maybe like real inference cost as well? In which case there will be sort of three foundation models and everything else will plug on top of them. And that's the extreme case. What actually seems to be happening is you're going to have lots of open source models of varying sizes, varying qualities, varying training costs, varying training data, some more public, some more closed, some are, you're going to have like a point cloud of LLMs. And what's not clear yet, but deterministically seems likely is that the models will get both more efficient for a given data set and therefore cheaper and smaller and smaller models will be made to work better and maybe then the retraining of the model can be done more efficiently and so there's an awful lot of optimization that's going to happen around this i mean there's a there's an old engineering joke that a russian screwdriver is a hammer because i don't know your audience so russians are famously not very subtle that's a stereotype is that russians tend to both be good at improvising but not very subtle people and so you know just hit it harder <laughs> and that's sort of how Moore's law works in tech. You start out with the the carefully optimized single point solution, and eventually you just give it more compute. So you think of a BlackBerry versus an iPhone. The BlackBerry is like very, very carefully optimized for little memory, little compute, little bandwidth. And the iPhone just says, screw it, give it more compute, give it more bandwidth, presume unlimited bandwidth, and let the telco worry about it. And this is what GPT is. This is just like, screw it, just give it more data. Give it much more data and much more compute. I mean, again, I'm being very unfair, but that's the core of it. Just throw more data at it and it gets better. We're almost now running that back and people say, yes, but now we need to get the screwdriver out. <laughs> and then we need to make that smaller because, I mean, I, there was a paper that went around a month or two ago, which was just trying to work out, well, how much data is there like in total, like all the data? And are we going to run out? Because if you keep giving like 10x more data to a model and you've already given GPT-4 this much data, not that that closes the joke, open AI is an open, it's closed AI. How, at what point do we actually run out of training data that we can put into the model? And the answer is like, well, not very far away, like quite soon. So that core question is, it seems like the models will get smaller and more efficient and more vertical. But Again, three weeks ago, everything was different. In another three weeks, everything will be different again. Totally agree. This, this is probably the question I ask, but it's always when people start asking me about whether AI should be regulated, I think that's the wrong question. I think the right question is, what are the things that people should be thinking about regulating rather than what are the questions people should be asking about regulation rather than regulating it? There's an ongoing scandal in the UK around the UK post office. And the UK post office is a sort of a franchise system. So a convenience store has a post office counter at the back mm. and it's owned by the convenience store. And sort of 15 years ago, the post office hired Fujitsu to write a new computer system for this. And the computer system had a bunch of bugs in it that showed shortfalls of cash. And the Fujitsu said, well, we can't see any bugs. And the post office said, aha, we knew they were stealing from us. And so they prosecuted five or 600 people for theft. People went bankrupt. People committed suicide. And people from Fujitsu and people from the post office went to court under oath and said, no, there's no bugs. No bugs at all. Meanwhile, they're looking at all these bug reports and they're seeing all the bugs and they know that there are bugs in it. 
this is an institutional failure, but it's also a failure of 1970s technology. It's not AI, it's not Google, it's not machine learning, it's it's SQL. And so I think it's very useful to think about machine learning in comparison to databases in general, in the sense that databases start out as being these amazing things. And now to ask how many databases are there on Earth would be a completely meaningless question. And when you go and use your access card to go into an office building, you don't say, I'm going to use a database now. It's just an access card. And that's sort of what machine learning has become. It means you don't, you don't say, oh, my God, it's AI. No, it's just image recognition. It's just voice recognition. It's just NLP. Mm. There's the old joke is AI is anything that doesn't work. As soon as it works, it's not AI anymore. It's just a database. It's just image recognition. And so all of this is a way of saying, like, make a list of all the problems that databases cause. And some of them are when people are doing bad things with them. Mm. And some of them are when there are mistakes and people don't accept the mistake all of those kinds of problems will happen again with machine learning it's like you know the stories of the man who's called muhammad ali who mm. can't get into america because somebody there's a terrorist called muhammad ali and like no one has managed to explain to the american government that there are like 20 million people called muhammad ali what do they agree that's yeah. that that's that, that's a database problem ah. um and machine learning will be the same it will cause problems when it works and it will cause problems when it doesn't work. Now it creates new ways that you can screw up. You can screw up with the training data. You can screw up with AI bias, which is, again, we could spend hours talking about. And of course there are new evil things you can do with it. Mm. So there are new ways you can screw up and there are new ways you can be evil. But that was all the conversation we had with databases as well. You can be evil with a database and you can screw up with a database. And I think that's the right general model to look at this. Hmm. So this is my last question and it's also the traditional closing question. What does great look like for this wave of generative AI startups? So I said earlier, it's actually very difficult to know what to invest in. Hmm. It's like, if you have recent Horowitz and you've got 50 or $60 billion under management, then you can give a giant check to OpenAI, presuming that OpenAI has a moat. And that's like, this is the question. Like if we all go to open source models, maybe not. But you know, that's a, that's a, that seems like a worthwhile bet to take. Otherwise, I mean, if you think about what's happening with machine learning over the last 10 years, we went from like AI as platform to image recognition as platform to I'm using image recognition to solve this very specific problem inside an industry. And at which point you're not really an AI company anymore. You're a problem that's solving sales process optimization, or you're solving defect management on high volume manufacturing lines, or you're solving some actual problem. And I think that's where the companies get created. Now, some of those opportunities are small, some of them are big. And I think many thanks for having this conversation. I really enjoy it. It's just philosophical to business. In closing, I just have two quick ones. Any recommendations which have inspired your life recently? Books or whatever. You all have very good recommendations. I usually try to get a book that I read and it gives me a different perspective about something in that era of time. I don't know. I mean... I suppose one sort of statement would be that it's an essay by Italo Calvino called Why Read the Classics? And he says, classics are the books where you always say, I am rereading that, never I am reading that. Because you never want to admit that you haven't read it. But, and that's probably true in every language, every country, oh yeah, I'm, I'm rereading that. Yeah, no, you haven't, you didn't read it. But most of those books are much easier to read than the term classic might make you think, especially once you've read the first five or 10 pages. Like the Iliad is really, really good. I mean, there's a reason why it's still around 3000 years later. Many of those books are really good. So maybe Mm. that would be my advice. So last question, how can my audience find you? But I will do one thing for you. I absolutely recommend the premium newsletter because I'm still a subscriber and also your podcast and other podcasts as well. Well, my parents had good, good SEO. So if you Google Benedict Evans, you'll find me. So I have a website. <laughs> and on the website, there is a podcast and a newsletter. And then there is Twitter as well. If you want to, if you want to, if you want to have arguments, then you can go to Twitter. Mm. Many thanks. The podcast can be found on YouTube and any podcast platform. And of course, drop us a feedback, drop us comments. And I'm always happy to take feedback. Benedict, many thanks for coming on the show. And I look forward to speak to you again. Great, thank you.